Hi, everybody. This is Gat Sat for the Sat Truth. Some of you may have heard of the term, uh, the null effect bias in science. So the null effect bias is basically the idea that many uh, editors of scientific journals will refuse to publish a paper if it reports null findings. Now, in some cases, null findings might simply be due to the fact that the, say, the relationships that you might have been studying uh, don't make any sense, right? So if I were to say, for example, uh, you know, I'm going to study whether eye color is correlated to the uh, type of car that I purchase, and then I find that there's no relationship between eye color and car purchases. Well, somebody might say, well, there's there was no conceivable reason why you would have studied that particular relationship, and the fact that you got a null effect uh, doesn't have any value. And in that case, of course, that's perfectly fair. But in many cases, you get a null effect uh, simply because, in this case, you're documenting a null relationship but be between variables that otherwise one could have uh, perfectly theorized that there would have been a relationship. And so here I'd like to discuss a, uh, a study that I had conducted uh, more than 15 years ago uh, that regrettably uh, succumbed to the null effect bias. And so let me give you the background. So I studied uh, in my doctoral dissertation and, uh, you know, after getting my first uh, appointment as a professor, psychology of decision making, specifically the area that I was interested in studying was, you know, when is it that people have acquired enough information to stop searching for more information and commit to a choice? So those are called stopping policies. And uh, at one point I started thinking about what are some moderators that might affect uh, these particular behaviors. So I thought at one point that I would uh, study something uh, that would be of relevance to clinical psychology as well uh, and link it to psychology of decision making. So I decided to focus on uh, dysphoria. So dysphoria is the opposite of euphoria. Uh, it's a transient state of blueness. So it's not quite, I just feel bad today, but it's, it's not typically quite uh, severe as, say, a clinical depression. But it's basically a persistent feeling of blueness. Uh, maybe your life sucks in terms of, you know, you, you're not getting along in your marriage, you hate your job, uh, your pet has passed away, and for all sorts of reason, reasons, you're feeling blue. And so, that, so, and so we could actually measure your level of dysphoria, how dysphoric you are. And so I wanted to study uh, whether dysphoria would affect specific uh, decision-making behaviors. Uh, and here the literature was very mixed. Uh, some studies have found that dysphoria uh, ameliorates cognitive effort. In other words, when you're feeling dysphoric, uh, you, you have a sense of sort of helplessness. And one of the ways that you might regain control in your life is to put more effort into a decision. And therefore, in this case, you would expect a positive relationship between dysphoria and, uh, say, the amount of information you search prior to making a choice. Others had found a negative relationship. So when you're feeling dysphoric, you're apathetic, you don't give a damn about anything. And so the last thing you want to do is to uh, expend cognitive effort. And therefore, in this case, a whole bunch of studies had found a negative relationship between dysphoria and various uh, measures of cognitive effort. Uh, if I remember correctly, some had found no relationship. I think maybe one or two papers, I'm going on memory here from many years ago, might have even found more complicated relationships, maybe a curvilinear relationship. And so the bottom line is that, you know, the, the, the relationship between dysphoria and cognitive effort and decision-making in general was quite complicated. And so I thought that in the context of what I was interested in studying, uh, you know, it would be really interesting to study how dysphoria manifests itself in that context. And so I ran a very, very elaborate study where I looked at, if I remember correctly, I think it was maybe 16 or 17 dependent measures. And I broke up people into whether they were dysphoric or non-dysphoric and uh, found a very, very robust finding that I think it was on every single measure other than one. Again, I'm going on memory. Uh, I'll put the link to my Psychology Today article where I uh, described the study in question uh, at the bottom of this clip. Uh, I think on nearly all of the metrics, uh, dysphorics and non-dysphorics uh, did not yield any differences between them, between them. In other words, there was value here in that there was a really robust null finding. 
And so I had submitted it to a special issue of a top journal that was specifically looking at the relationship between emotion and cognition, in this case, decision making. And the editor had gotten back to me and said, pretty much he was admitting to the null effect bias, saying that, look, this is good stuff, great paper, but regrettably, of course, you have all these null findings. Of course, my position was that, you know, documenting the robustness of these null findings is actually very important to the literature, right? So now for the past 15 years, very few people are aware of these particular findings, precisely because I wasn't able to publish them because the findings were null. Now think of a analysis that I mentioned a few sad truths ago. I can't remember which one it was, where I talked about uh, meta-analysis, right? A meta-analysis is where you take uh, many, many different studies and you put them into one sort of mega study to get sort of the bottom line picture of a phenomenon. So if you wanted to study, say, this, the relationship between dysphoria and cognitive effort, you would, some studies have found a positive relationship, some studies have found a negative relationship, some studies have found no relationship, others have found a curvilinear relationship. Well, if we put it all together, is there some bottom line overriding effect that is reaped via the meta-analysis? Now imagine if all the studies that don't, that are not published uh, because they, they, they report null findings are not included in the meta-analysis, then you end up having a very uh, inaccurate view of the state of affairs in that literature. And so it is profoundly important for uh, good science uh, to progress that, that papers not be solely published if they report sexy findings and surprising findings and counterintuitive findings, but rather, if the methodology, if the theory, if there there are no, uh, you know, systematic problems with the study, uh, and if it tells a important, uh, if it reports an important finding, then I think it is incumbent on editors to uh, publish these findings, lest we end up having a skewed uh, understanding of the state of the state of affairs of that particular uh, question that's being posed. So there you have it. If you are academics and you're listening to this, or if you're perhaps graduate students listening to this, uh, make sure that you uh, hopefully move the conversation forward so that null effects uh, are not considered the pariah that they currently are. Uh, they're important to the advancement of science. Uh, later today, I'll be chatting with Dave Rubin. I hope that you'll check it out. Please subscribe if you haven't done so. Uh, let's try to increase the subscriber base of this channel. And uh, please consider uh, supporting the channel via Patreon. It takes me a lot of time to put these clips together. And I would certainly appreciate if uh, people would uh, help out by uh, supporting the channel. Thanks a lot. Talk to you soon. Ciao.